You're watching This Week in Louisiana Politics with Fred Childers. Good morning, I'm Fred Childers. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. State leaders are mulling over a decision on whether or not legislators should come back for a special session to address the insurance crisis, and some are split on the idea. The Senate President and Speaker of the House met with Governor John Bell Edwards earlier this week to discuss the possibility. The insurance commissioner claims there are eight companies considering coming to Louisiana, and the incentive fund needs money to help bring them here, but some are skeptical. Tell us who they are and let us ask them if they would be willing to come if this incentive program were put in place. Um, because if, if that's the case, then it's, it's a no-brainer. We would have to go in and, 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 and fund the incentive program. The speaker says he believes the issue would be better handled during the regular session. That starts in April. Both leaders agreed that something needs to be done to address the insurance issues in the state. Another Republican announced this week he is now in the race to become governor. State Representative Richard Nelson of Mandeville joins a line of Republicans who want Louisiana's highest office. He brings a more moderate approach and is the youngest candidate in the race at 36 years old. Nelson has been a member of the State House of Representatives since 2019. There he's focused on student literacy and reforming the state's tax code. We can all agree Louisiana has so many, you know, so many resources, so much great, you know, so many things going for it. Like to be at the bottom of all these lists is just is just a tragedy. And so I've been in the legislature for the last, you know, three or four years and I've worked on trying to fix these issues. And really, I have recognized you can't really fix them unless you're in the governor's office. Now he goes up against state Senator Sharon Hewitt, Treasurer John Schroeder and Attorney General Jeff Landry. You'll hear from Nelson a little later on in the show, so stay tuned for that. A week after he told donors he was running for governor, Treasurer John Schroeder, who we just mentioned, released his official campaign video. In it, he says he will take on the liberal establishment. He also focuses on crime, as other candidates are. Schroeder originally planned to officially kick off his campaign in February, but now things are heating up. A proposed bill would allow Louisiana mothers to recover half of her out-of-pocket pregnancy medical expenses from the baby's father. Capitol reporter Shannon Hex spoke to the bill's author, who says his bill makes things fair. A proposed bill could have fathers on the hook for half of pregnancy-related expenses. House Bill 5 by Representative Larry Freeman opens up a mother to take action through the courts to get the father of the child to pay 50% of the out-of-pocket expenses. Freeman says it's not fair for only women to pay all the expenses. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade in Louisiana having a near-total ban on abortion, Freeman says his bill will be a benefit to women around the state. A paternity test would have to be performed on the child to prove who the father is in order to receive the court order. The action could be taken up to two years after birth. And Utah also has a similar bill that passed in 2021. According to a Kaiser Family Foundation study in 2022, the prenatal, childbirth, and postpartum medical costs are estimated at around $18,000 without insurance. Out of pocket for those enrolled in large group insurance plans is around $3,000. Freeman says this is not child support, but rather brings fundamental fairness to covering the cost of pregnancy. The bill will be debated during the regular session that begins on April 10th. For your local election headquarters, I'm Shannon Hacked. We'll be keeping an eye on that bill. Organizers of the recall effort for Mayor Latoya Cantrell have a little over a month left to collect 20,000 signatures, making the recall seem a little less likely. Now, the momentum was strong in the beginning, but with five weeks left, the petition has only received 30,000 signatures and they need around 54,000. They are a little over the halfway point with signatures. Political analysts believe Cantrell still has a lot of hardcore supporters that won't be signing that petition. It's about a thousand a day that they're going to need over the next month or so, and it's certainly an uphill climb. Uh, they're going to need to do a lot more advertising. I think they're planning on uh, doing another blitz. They're planning on another mailing to uh, another 120,000 uh, folks out there. So they're going to hope that a fourth of the people that get a petition sign it and send it in. Even recently claims of an affair hasn't budged that recall effort. 
After a rash of recent crime in New Orleans, the city council called a special meeting to talk about how to address the issue. The hours long meeting was packed with city leaders from the interim police superintendent to the school's superintendent. Jordan Lippincott reports. Work with the people and see what the problem is and fix it. Tensions were high at Wednesday's special meeting of the New Orleans City Council as those in attendance heard troubling statistics. Like New Orleans saw the highest number of murders in 2022 since Hurricane Katrina. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Look, look. Excuse me. Some in the meeting battling with council members over airing their frustrations. Many attendees insisted that the city's crime problem stems from the lack of attention and resources directed toward the youth. They're crying out for our, our love, our attention, our affection. They need our help. And what have we done? In response to what city leaders are calling the public health crisis of violence, the council voted in favor of the New Orleans Health Department developing a violence intervention model using evidence-based interventions like increasing safe gun storage and boosting the traditional summer jobs program. This is a years-long process that the health department will commit itself to, and I know there are many people in the community who will as well as our business and civic leaders have. And in those efforts, the New Orleans Mental Health Collaborative was awarded a $2 million federal grant for trauma-informed care and youth services. And I think the one thing I feel like I heard today from everybody in the audience is we need urgency. Yep. And, and, and I think that urgency means how do we break through barriers, how do we work together where we can, and then understanding that now that dollars have been allocated, that we have the money, that management is the last piece of that. Jordan Lippincott reporting. Republicans have taken control of the House on Capitol Hill. Up next, we'll hear from one Republican Louisiana lawmaker about his and the party's priorities for the state going forward. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Louisiana lawmakers celebrated a new collaboration between Xavier and Oshner. The university is now preparing to offer medical degrees to future doctors. This will be the first HBCU med school in the state of Louisiana, but it will be a few years before we see the first class. Congressman Troy Carter, an alum of Xavier, says the addition of the med school will help bridge the diversity gap and potentially keep more doctors in the state. School that produces uh, doctors to go to go to medical school. How nice is it that they can just stay here in New Orleans and go to medical school, continue to be a part of our economy, continue to create a stronger brain trust. It's a real win-win. Xavier and Oshner officials say this med school will not only help solve the critical shortage of physicians in the U.S., but also help meet the needs of our diverse community. Also in development news, hundreds of millions of dollars are flooding into the state of Louisiana to build another Exxon facility. This is a project that leaders believe will better the state's economy. ExxonMobil's polypropylene growth project is creating 65 new full-time jobs and has created more than 600 construction jobs alone. Governor John Bell Edwards and others explain how this will benefit Louisiana. 
Each of these investments will bring more jobs, more careers, more opportunity that stabilizes families and communities. Uh, and, and it just helps move our state forward. The project at Exxon is positioning our economy for 2050, not just now, but for what does the world need. The project is part of ExxonMobil's 10-year plan to invest more than $20 billion to expand manufacturing facilities. This week, Congressman Clay Higgins made a trip back to Acadiana. He gave an update on some of his key goals now that Republicans have control of the House of Representatives. Congressman Higgins spoke about how American energy dominance will be determined in South Louisiana. He contends the will of the people is to move into a greener and cleaner era. He believes the right balance has to be found to aggressively pursue American energy production. That production has been has been uh, suppressed by the Biden administration for a couple of years and arguably longer out of, out of our own state capital. The congressman says there will be several investigations. Higgins says Congress has investigative authority over the executive branch. He is also now on the oversight committee. He says he's one of the senior Republicans on that committee. Coming up, state lawmaker Richard Nelson is the latest to throw his hat in the ring to become Louisiana's next governor. So, of course, we're talking to him. It's kind of what we do. Shannon Hecht is up next. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. The gubernatorial race is continuing to gain candidates. Here's one with me now, Richard Nelson. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit why you wanted to get into this race. So I quote all the time, if Louisiana was just average in the country, we'd all live four years longer and get a 33% raise. And to me, that's a tragedy. And it really shows the kind of lost opportunity because I think we can all agree Louisiana has so many, you know, so many resources, so much, you know, so many things going for it. Like to be at the bottom of all these lists is just, is just a tragedy. And so I've been in the legislature for the last, you know, three or four years, and I've worked on trying to fix these issues. And really, I've recognized you can't really fix them unless you're in the governor's office. That's really uh, the one who really drives the train. And, you know, Huey Long set it up that way. Hey, the governor's going to be very powerful. Um, and so I think when you're looking at the scope of change that we need to fix those kind of problems, you really have to be in the governor's office. Right. You talk about early, early literacy is something that you've really focused on. So what can you do differently in the governor's office that you really haven't been able to tackle in the House? So I, I brought a bill last year um, to basically require that third graders be able to read before they get promoted up. Uh, this is something that's been replicated from um, Mississippi, who's gone from below us in third grade or in fourth grade reading to 21st in the country, like very just blew us out of the water. And so uh, it failed in the Senate last year. And so I'm going to bring it again this year, and I hope it passes. But that's one of those things that, as governor, you can really champion. You can really get people on your side in order to make sure that it happens. And so it doesn't happen so that we're maybe right. You know, last year we were 10 years behind Mississippi, and now we're 11. So you can't, you can't have that delay when you're really trying to catch up and close these big gaps. And a topic that's going to be really a focus for this election is crime here in Louisiana, especially in southeast Louisiana. So what are ways that you want to tackle that issue? So, yeah, I think that one of the most important things is you really have to have swift and certain justice. And that's two things that we just don't have now. Um, 
lots of people get away with it. I mean, that, that's why there's so much crime. I think as, a, as governor, I would take and use the, uh, the state troopers. I mean, you're head of the state police. I think that's a big resource that, you know, if it was a hurricane or something else, you would, you would respond to that and send lots of people to respond. And what we're seeing now is not, not that level of action. And I think this is one of those things that it affects so many people and it's so, so important that I think something like sending more state troopers, you know, having a, a high crime task force in the state police to just, you know, flood those areas with high, that, are, that are experiencing high crime, just so that you can clamp it down. And then I think you have to address the underlying problems in crime, right? Like it's uh, a lack of education. You know, a lot of those guys, they can't read. They weren't taught how to read. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they don't have a lot of opportunity. Uh, the other thing is economic opportunity. I mean, where is it? You have to bring it here so that people have other ways that they can go and make a living for their families. And we've talked about this several times, but the income tax, you're planning to bring some legislation to do away with it. So can you tell me about how this is really going to improve Louisiana? So if you look at, if you look at where people are moving, right? Um, Texas and Florida in the last 10 years, they grew six times faster than we did. Um, the last, the, you know, the Census Bureau released the, the data um, a few months ago about uh, the states that lost the most population. Florida and Texas both don't have an income tax. They're number one and two on the list. Louisiana is third from the bottom. We had lost, the, you know, I think the third most people in the, last, in the last year. So I think when you look at it across the country, the things that are really effective at, at bringing new people here is not having an income tax. And the other side of that coin for Louisiana is it really, we have these kind of Huey Long instituted structural changes in our tax, uh, problems in our tax code. And that's what's been around for a long time. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the last time Louisiana added a congressional seat was 1910. And so these problems have been around, around a long time and we're continuously you know, lagging the country in this population growth and the states that don't have an income tax are blowing up. So I think it makes us more competitive and it lets us, uh, gives us the opportunity to fix some of these structural changes that have been around for a long time. And I want to talk to you about this field of candidates that you're now jumping into. You're another Republican after the LA GOP has really told people to rally behind Jeff Landry. So what's kind of your response to all that going on right now? So, uh, you know, I'm a bipartisan candidate. That's, that's the reality. Um, I'm not trying to say, hey, I'm Republican. You should vote for me because I'm Republican. Uh, in the legislature, I've been a very bipartisan member of the legislature. Uh, I, I really uh, believe in ideas. Uh, ideas are what's going to fix things. Solutions are what's going to fix things, not political parties. Uh, and so I, I, don't think that this can I don't think this race has a bipartisan um, person or a candidate in it until I got in. And I think that's really what people want to hear. I, I, in reality, I don't think people are as divided as you know, we see in the national politics and stuff. I think the state of Louisiana, I think we all recognize we really need to focus on the answers, on really improving people's lives. And just parroting some uh, political uh, party talking points is not going to help. So I think that there's a, there's a middle lane here where somebody that is really offering solutions can really, um, can really fill in. And this race is expected to be one of the most expensive, you know, high price tags with all of these, uh, like Jeff Landry has millions already. So how does it feel kind of going up against someone who already has this big operation already going? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's the, that's the benefit of being a career politician is you raise lots of money. I'm not a career politician. I don't have all that, uh, all that money. I don't owe anybody any favors. Uh, at the same time, I am nimble. I'm young. I can use social media to, to ver really, I think, is a great equalizer in this because you can reach 10 million people very quickly on social media for very a very little amount of money that, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, you would have never had a chance to reach them. So I think that there's a lot of things in this current cycle that will favor a younger candidate and especially a younger candidate that's not uh, divisive and is really focused on the solutions. So I think you know, it's, a, it's an election, not an auction. And so when people go into the ballot, uh, I think, um, to vote, I think that they will have those things in mind. And it's not, I've never heard anybody say I voted for him because he had the most money. Uh, this is how it works. So. Right, you bring it up that you are the youngest candidate and, you know, there's been several young uh, politicians who have been elected to office in the last couple of midterms and everything. So why do you feel that, you know, you're ready for this now? You've been in the House for just a few years now. So why now? So I've, uh, I spent seven years in the Foreign Service. I'm an engineer and attorney. So I have a, a lot of other experience that I think really plays into being able to solve these problems. I think being in the legislature for four years is uh, long enough to figure out what the problems are, 
to build the relationships that I need in order to actually get things done, I think that that's necessary. I mean, honestly, if you've never served in the legislature in Louisiana, I think you don't really have a good grasp on the issues. I, I, it's just difficult to do. So I've spent years of my life now focused on that. And I think you have to have relationships with the legislators. You have to have relationships with everyone. Uh, and that's really what drives progress, I think, in the Capitol. So um, I really am in a place to really, uh, to, once I get elected, to really make those changes that are necessary. And I, I think spending more time there, I don't know if that really helps me. Uh, if I wanted to be a career politician, I could run for re-election uh, and not have a giant complicated race and you know, have a much more certain outcome. But I think if you, I, I'm running for ideas. I'm running to make the changes. And to do that, you gotta make this, you gotta make this leap. Well, Richard, anything you would like folks to know right out the gate about you that we haven't talked about yet? Um, yeah, I think that uh, people uh, should ha just look at the candidates and just take a good look about what they stand for and what they're trying to do. I think you gotta get past the, get past the talking points, um, get past the attack ads, and really look is this going to add that four years and 33% income, right? Are you going to get that back? Do they have that idea? Do you think they can accomplish that? I think that's going to be the key here. Um, I, I think it, for me, it's, it's good because I think people care a lot about who their governor is. They want to know, is this a good guy? And what are they going to, I mean, how are they going to help me? And that's really what I'm running on. I'm, I'm depending on people to really care. And I think that they do. And I think that that's why we're going to be successful. All right. Well, thank you. We'll be following your campaign very closely. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Looking ahead to the coming week on Tuesday, the study commission on deterring sex offenses against children will meet at the Capitol at 930. Also on Tuesday, the disability voting task force will be providing an update. And as always, we'll be keeping a close eye on the governor's race for any more candidate announcements. We suspect there might be a few more, but who knows? Thank you for joining us for this week in Louisiana politics. I'm Fred Childers. Stay informed and I'll see you next Sunday right here on your local election headquarters.